Well, happy new year, you filthy animals. Is that how we're starting? <laughs> Ringing in the new year. Let's see what else we can do. Happy new year, you uh, whirling, twirling lawnmowers. How's that one? It was getting so close. <laughs> we're here, tips frosted and gung-ho, ready for a new year of content creation, the thing God put us on this green earth yes. to do. <laughs> What's that Japanese word for like, the thing you'll the get ikigai. out of the, Yep, this is our ikigai. <laughs> and today, ikigai is reading tennis shoes among the Nephites. <laughs> we're reading this for our ikigais. <laughs> <laughs> How are all our Iki guys doing? It's always tough to get back into the vibe of filming after a Christmas break where you've wrestled with everything you contain. <laughs> Fully emotionally burnt out, vitamin D depleted. I haven't breathed pure oxygen in what feels like years mm -hmm. due to living in Salt Lake City. Uh, but that may have fun effects on the trajectory of this episode. We have had so many comments for years telling us to read Tennis Shoes Among the Nephites, but we have been in such a Jack Wayland fueled haze for like what four years we haven't had eyes for anything else no jack and has been our primary our, in fact our one and only i am ashamed everyone's posting their like read lists of the year and i was every like, year you say this <laughs> last year you said to me sam i saw your reading list and i thought i need an adderall prescription <laughs> but you still like gain so much knowledge every year so i think like yeah. you're fine i do a lot of listening it just seems like you don't enjoy reading, reading a book just for kind of the, exp I mean, <laughs> it's easy. It's actually easier for me to, I, I don't know. There's just, I, I have seasons. I yeah. have seasons. Yeah. Well, you don't have to define yourself. <laughs> <laughs> Thank God for this channel or I'd never get a taste of good literature. This year we're not doing definitions. We're not doing personalities <laughs> and we're not doing epidermal water loss. What Absolutely are not. some of your intentions for the year? Oh, intentions. <laughs> or just anything. I guess I just feel like we should have a bit of a new year chat. Well, like all sentient beings, my primary intention is to survive, <laughs> to reproduce, if not physically, then at least uh, spiritually by providing content that will out surpass me and live on. I know. I'm like, these videos will live me. longer than a baby. Yeah. How about you? Any good uh, intentions? Well, it is to become the mother of this series. Um, <laughs> other than that, I don't know. I already shared them on my Instagram, so now I'm just like <laughs> done talking about them. But I really am trying to go into a year of not apologizing when I don't need to. And I know it sounds trite, but it's just clicked in a new way for me being myself and not apologizing for it. It's hard because like, uh, well, just as humans, we're like constantly made to feel shame for mm -hmm. everything mm -hmm. to have our be presented with our inferiority and our 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 loss of lack of status or whatever it's constantly confronted as it and then with the incentive to consume our way out of mm -hmm. it or distract our way out of it and I find myself like even in just like ordinary conversations qualifying feeling like I have to qualify yeah. everything the single thing I say otherwise everyone will take things but in like that do you know what I realized last year was that I think a lot of the time my qualifying because it comes from an insecurity of, I don't want them to think I mean this, but then in qualifying, it almost makes them think that more, or it makes, I think it in ways, it almost made me come across as more shifty. Uh -huh. And I think a big reason I became such a people pleaser is like in response to a spiritual awakening that showed me I wasn't thinking about others enough. And then I just think it's human to do a, like too extreme of a pendulum swing and to then become so afraid of like ever being that again, mm -hmm. that you then like lose what was good and healthy about the way that you were. Like, I do think there was something healthy in the way I used to be. And you know, the way we all tend to be when we're younger, when you just have less abandon. Mm -hmm. I don't know, I guess it's all just about like coming to trust that you can like lean into being yourself and it, you're not just gonna like, you know, murder everyone in your path emotionally by doing that but you might but that doesn't necessarily mean you are doing anything wrong yeah it's just allows you to be more like authentic to in the moment yeah. and, and sometimes i honestly think yeah i don't think people like people they can tell are clamoring for them to like them that's that's what i realized as well i was like this isn't working people liked me more when i was bitchier yeah so i'm going bitchy this year me oh, too. Okay, hi, welcome to the video. Did you see that video from George Santos about being asked about empathy? Oh God. Where she was, she was like, uh, how would you define empathy? And he's like, you know, a lot of people accuse me of not having empathy, but I can't really even say what it is. <laughs> and she's like, she's like, so you don't have empathy? And he's like, no, I have it. I just don't, I can't really say what it is. See, that is an example <laughs> of radical myselfness. 
He's not apologizing. No. And why like, should he have to? He didn't choose to not have empathy. He's like, how can I be something if I don't even know what it is? How could I? <laughs> I have it, but it's in there somewhere. Don't worry. Well, I'm so excited for Tennis Shoes Among the Nephites for a little backstory. I grew up not reading this book, but we had the board game, presumably sold through Deseret Book, Nightmare. that is like a sort of Monopoly thing, but infused with Mormon trivia. And mm. there was a booklet that came with the game. I don't think I ever actually played the board game, maybe once or twice. What we usually played was the trivia game, where my dad would just open up the book and do trivia, and if we answered correctly, we'd get a marshmallow or a chocolate chip called a oh. chocolate chip game. And that's how, as like a four-year-old, my dad could be like, "Where? what was the name of the water where Alma and Amulek were baptized? And I'd be like, the waters of Sebus? <laughs> he had no idea how well he was priming you for anti-Mormon creation. <laughs> being your, what's the word again? Ikigai? Ikigai. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, keep doing that. <laughs> so, uh, that is my history with this brand. I love it. I love the brand concept generally just because tennis shoes among the Nephites wouldn't even be like the top 10 most intense anachronism. <laughs> that would only be, you know, a few like, what, 1,600 years, yeah. 2,600 years as opposed to being millions. Of, you know, it's, there's a lot. There's a lot. I can't wait to get into it. Um, just know, knowing how these things go, being so exposed to Jack Wayland, can't wait to get another little... Yeah, uh, baby of Deseret Book in yes. my in my brain. Because at this baby. point, this is just a living shelf for Jack. <laughs> and we aren't abandoning Jack forever, but we are taking a little foray into Chris. Jack and his ink ilk. <laughs> yes, um, I've never read this, but I do know that every Mormon ever has read it because at BYU Idaho, it feels like everyone knew about it. But I just think because I didn't grow up Mormon, it was too you know I wasn't going to mm. really read it. While think, in college. I think they also had it on tape, and that's how a lot of I remember being on a road trip with you on a Sunday, and you, you, like, your brother was driving us back to college or something, and you listened to it. It was playing uh, in the car. But I think I was just completely cheated Yeah, because I have heard a little bit of... Yeah. So tell us your uh, relationship to this book growing up, and without further ado, do you want to give any kind of, like... Elevate, like, tell anyone what this book is roughly about. If you have no idea what the Book of Mormon is, it's a 1800s Bible fanfic that was written by Joseph Smith, uh, allegedly by looking at a rock that he had previously used to defarm fraud or, uh, defy, defraud farmers on these wild treasure goose hunts. Uh, he used the stone to be like, ooh, go over there and bury treasure. Find the buried treasure, and of course they never did. And he used this same stone, allegedly, to dictate the contents of the Book of Mormon, which allegedly contains the record of a family of Jews who built uh, a magical ship that couldn't possibly con be constructed under any any intelligible, rational uh, like criteria. It just like couldn't have happened. Listen to, sorry, I'm going God so far off on the tangent here. No, this here. is great. Uh, Wrap it up there. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Getting too into the Book into of Mormon, the woods. Bible fanfic. Bible fanfic. Jews coming to America. They represent the principal ancestors of the Native Americans. The Mormons are the real Jews. It's full of uh, uh, anach historical anachronisms. Uh, uh, an 1800s farm boy's imagined uh, origin story of the Native Americans. And in this tale, I believe we're gonna. There's some kind of magical portal that's opened up for these kids from the present day. What what year was this written? Good question. 1989. 1989. So the, these kids are going to go back in time to Book of Mormon times. Kind of like the Narnia of Mormonism, would you say? Yeah. I How think that's cool. a good... <laughs> and honestly, just as fantastical of a world. <laughs> well, if that hasn't hooked you, our commentary Nothing might will. not either. You're, you need a dopamine reset. Something's wrong with you fundamentally. <laughs> okay, I'm starting. Prologue. I didn't write this story. I realize it was written in the first person and the main character is me. Let me explain. I was going through my box of nostalgia some days ago. Mum had tucked it all away in the attic above the garage the year I went off to BYU. I found a manila envelope right under my seventh grade theses on Louis Pasteur. Inside was a stack of erasable bond typing paper. The erasable characteristic was well abused. Exhaust from the back end of a pencil was still trapped between many of the pages as if the manuscript had never been read before I blew off the dust. Quite a poetic opener, I'd say. Totally, but Exhaust also... Exhaust from the back end of a pencil. 
I love the Louis Pasteur reference. This has been infiltrated by the vaccination propaganda. Who is Louis Pasteur? I think he was like the father of germ theory. Of pasteurization? And yeah, pasteurization. Ah, yeah, exactly. What a thing to be known for. Yeah, maybe not germ theory, but in that field mm-hmm. and was heavily into mm-hmm. <laughs> So this is like the narrator of the story telling us like what you're about to read in chapter one is in the first person and the main character is me, but I didn't write this story. Is that like God God wrote the story? God is it's God did this. Usually not God me. if you don't remember. There's so many layers in this because we have like an author who's doing a fictional thing Mm. saying that the fictional character didn't write it. Maybe the fictional character has some sort of self-awareness about being a fictional character, not realizing that their God is actually Chris Heimerdinger. (laughs) Imagine Didn't need a a stage name. Just just remember that. (laughs) No pen name. He's like, perfect. Pen name. That's what Yeah, yeah. This is this is great. Heim- what if that is his screen or his pen name? He's like Heimerdinger. His real name is so odious that it was like Heimerdinger, Heimerdinger is so many us. steps up. I love that. Yeah. Desert books like we love the book. Uh, we have one one issue that we. I mean, just truly from like a spelling and searchability perspective, like catch me never being able to spell Heimerdinger in my lifetime. Like that's not happening. <laughs> Hi, Merdinger. I hardly... Yeah, okay. Yeah, that's a big one. <laughs> Besides me, my best friends out of my 13th year also play big parts in the story. I have a theory. My grandma Tucker passed away when I was 15. I have no way to confirm it, but my guess is that she's the author. Okay, not God. Grandma, a woman. Oh, okay, all right. Woman Sorry author. Sorry for the hasty Very interesting. conclusions. The theory leaves a lot unexplained, but it's all I have. Those wily grandmothers. And if that isn't Mormonism in a nutshell. (laughs) This leaves a lot unexplained, but it's it's all I have. (laughs) The images in the story come at me like headlights. I should know what lies behind the light, but I can't paint a picture in my brain. It's hard for me to believe that anybody, even my grandmother, could have pegged me so well. That's... Language just is (laughs) ever-changing, and I think that's so beautiful. (laughs) Nobody knew me like that. Thoughts are exposed in it that I never revealed to anybody. Now that that's the context, I can't unhear it and everything following is. Sometimes when I'm in that trance between laying my head on the pillow and and falling asleep with classical music on the cassette, my thoughts become the music and the music becomes my thoughts. I see unknown faces and I hear snatches of unfamiliar voices. I don't know if it's deja vu or revelation. I can't touch it like a coin in cloudy water that shines when the sun hits it just right, but never for long enough to grab it. It occurs to me that our connection with the pre-mortal world might be described the same way. They say we only use 2% of our brains. Who says that? People with only 2% of their brain? (laughs) Perhaps the other 98% is already filled. I'm already getting lost. <laughs> Honestly, I miss Jack already. I really miss Jack. <laughs> you know how you prefer you prefer a familiar yes, pain than the a new devil, one. Yes, best the devil, you know, yep. 100%. Like, who is Chris? Why am I handing Heimer over? Heimerdinger. I mean, like, Waylon has a book. university named after him. The Jack yes, Waylon School, School of, of Literary, literary Tricks. Tricks. Merch available now. <laughs> I keep hoping someone will snap his fingers and it will all become clear. But if not, I have faith in veils and the parting of veils. Whether in this life or the next, I hope the images will be returned to me so I can pull my face off the canvas and see the painting from a distance. What is he talking about? A lot of mixed metaphors here. We I'm got like, the veils, we got the paintings, we got the music. Like, I have no idea what's going on. on. My grandma could be at fault for this, but music is a thing and veils are a thing. And I think, honestly, it's just confusion all the way down. Just veils, 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 veils. And you're just like, I'm like, wah, but I, re- I love this. There must be so many more colors than words could ever describe. So he's written a book that he doesn't remember writing properly, that he doesn't feel he is the true author of, and there are more colors now than words could ever describe, or he sensed that there are. Oh, he's seen that full light spectrum. Let me just say, if the main character is really supposed to be me, there was one slight misrepresentation. I don't remember ever being such a sarcastic little snot. That point remains for me the strongest evidence that the whole thing is fictional. Honestly, it's stronger than the evidence that the Book of Mormon is historical. Yeah, you're like, so I couldn't possibly be this enough. good. Compare that to Joseph Smith, who's like, oh my god, here in the book it says that I'll be the greatest prophet that will ever live. 
Joseph, that's, that's awesome. Not me. <laughs> it, it just says his name will be Joseph, and I'm not going to say that's me, but it does say Joseph, isn't that just Just kind of feels like someone else should be given the job to translate the book if the book's going to be like, no one question this guy. It just feels like it should come from someone else. No one could be that obnoxious, not even a 13-year-old. Me reading Don't. my own journal and being like, this must have been written by my grandma. This kid is too much of an idiot. <laughs> That was kind that was of us and considered us to read the prologue. Let's yeah, let's just press chapter on. Chapter one. My parents named me Jamie, a name I thought better suited for girls or French poodles. I or much French pref- girls who want to be poodles. <laughs> <laughs> I much prefer Jim, and whoever tries to call me Jamie had better be much bigger than me or have endured two years of karate because I've endured one. Love that he's right out the gate with the, I've taken a year of karate. (laughs) It's important to establish that the main character has karate training. Yeah, especially if he's going to be fighting Lamanites. Yeah, yes. (laughs) And I just love the thought of like, anyone calls me by my real name, I will roundhouse kick them in the face. (laughs) Unless they're bigger than me or have done two years of karate. Yeah, (laughs) karate. I was born in a big town, Billings, Montana. My parents moved to Cody, Wyoming when I was seven. Their motive was to keep me bored in my youth. There are no shopping malls. They have only one movie theater and it has no matinees. Ah, yes, the reason that most people in those towns turn to drugs. (laughs) Nothing to do. Not having art or culture available to you. Brilliant, no matinees. There's one main street called Sheridan Avenue. The buildings on Sheridan boast big fronts with big signs, but you can see from the alley they're only half that tall. That's why I always like to walk down the alley more than the sidewalks. Um, you can see where... Okay, so he likes to see the true height of things. I don't know if that's anything. In the alley, people gotta be honest. Yeah, they do. What is this alley? <laughs> it's like, I identify more with alley culture than my mom and family. Honestly, same. An alley cat at heart. <laughs> they don't dress in... Su- yeah, he's an alley cat. They don't dress in suit coats and ties. Their shirts hang out. People who work or walk in an alley always wear something with a hole in it. It shows you won't change for anybody, which is the theme of the year, but I am confused. Like, what? Am I thinking of an alley as something different? Like, what does he mean, work in the alley? I He he just, like, has no concept about how, like, uh, metropolitan social dynamics, social economic dynamics are playing out. He thinks that there's a group of people that choose the alley, choose to have the rips. The alley life chosen, yeah, though. And they're like, I'm doing this to make a statement that nothing will change me. Versus just, like, <clears throat> poverty, mental health, disability. Nah, yeah, it's because they're self-actualized. Yeah, I, I, too, love cosplaying poverty. It's so fun. Cody sits in the dust, this is the town, that settled between the Washaki... Sorry, I don't know how to pronounce anything in that uh, genre of words. And Bighorn Mountains. They call it the Bighorn Basin. Might as well call it a desert. Standing at our front gate, if I look east, I see the McCullough Peaks. They aren't peaks, really, just hills the wind made jagged. There are only two colors in that direction, grayish-brown and brownish-gray. Looking west, Cedar and Rattlesnake Mountains stand side by side. It's a lot of logistical details. I'm really... He's losing me. I mean, I think he's trying to set the stage that we are on a boring stage. We're and in a we boring need a call place. to adventure stat. Yes, yes. <laughs> it's cut down the middle by the Shoshone River. The way they tower so close to town, it ruins our sunsets. Our highway goes between them. It's the only way to get to Yellowstone Park from here. As far as my family rank, I'm second to the youngest. Mitch and Stephen are in high school. Judd is in ninth grade. I still command... Ew. I still command a little sister, Jenny... Though she doesn't take orders too well. Just the inherent thing of, like, if, it's, if someone's younger, then you command them. Or a woman. <laughs> Pet him. Or a girl, like... How old is he? 13? Does he have the priesthood? Oh, yes. Well, I believe he's He 13. has more authority than the Pope. He can command anybody that he wants. My dad used to be a high school English teacher, but about the time I started fifth grade, he became the principal of the junior high. So now that I'm a seventh grader, the teachers don't mess with me for a change. Back at Eastside Elementary... I can't count the times my sixth grade teacher, Mrs. Adabak, yes, that was her real name, coming from you, Chris, (laughs) had me drag my desk into the hallway for passing notes to Greg Shelby or whispering too loud or for sticking the shiny point of a newly sharpened pencil slowly into the small of Garth Plimpton's back until he snapped forward and arched back. Homoerotic, I love it. As if a couple thousand volts had just shot through him. Okay, lot to unpack. Sounds like Jim... Well, his name is Jamie, but he's insisting that we, we've never taken 
karate, so we should probably call we him should Jim. Call him, I don't want to venture to Jamie. Yeah, I doubt I'm taller than him either, so... Yeah, really doubt it. So, um, he has issues with authority, it sounds like. And oh, he yeah. he longs to have people, you know, be under his command. Yeah. Which yeah. tracks with Mormon origin stories and the Book of Mormon and... He's got a tood. He's got a tood, yeah. Oh, so we're, you know, from the prologue, we're to discover that he is transformed by this experience. Oh, because now he looks back and he doesn't even relate doesn't even to relate. this bad boy. He used to think ties were like nooses hung around our necks by the patriarchy to keep us in line. Now he's willingly. Now he sees that they are freedom. Yep, that white shirt. <clears throat> bury me in it like a whited sepulcher. Goth was a gawky looking guy. Skinny, with red hair and white skin and freckles on his arms. To top it off, he had green eyes. You could find Garth in the sixth grade yearbook under wimps. <laughs> I'm just openly bullying children in the yearbook sections. Yeah. <laughs> like, <laughs> there's no teachers signing off <laughs> on just public humiliation. <laughs> wow. It was me, Greg Shelby, Tom Slater, and Bob Jakovich in those days. Do we need all the last names? I just, no. like, I can't imagine we're going to encounter another Bob, Tom, or Greg. So, like... Where are these names? Greg Shelby, Tom Slater, and Bob Jakovich in those days. We called ourselves the Vikings. Plunder and destroy was our motto. The masses feared and hated us. Oh, so he's in a bad boy bully group, sounds the like. The Vikings. The Vikings, sounds very pillagers, scary. plundering, putting a pencil in Garth's skinny white back. We caused many recurring nightmares for kids who even gave us a slanted look. Wow, so that's why he feels more comfortable in alley culture because he's in a gang, it yeah. sounds like. I bet they hang out in the alleys. And they're Mormons, so they probably have little choreographed songs and dances, if we're being honest. <laughs> Which somehow only, like, increases their ability to commit violence together. <laughs> so well. Takes them to an irrational, kind yeah. of illogical, Yeah, it's a fever dream state. through yep. dance. Um, I love male Mormon authors writing about bad boys like Jack does it too just mm -hmm. what they think it would mean to be bad or like um, Saturday's Warrior mm -hmm. you haven't seen our Saturday's Warrior reaction video one of my favorite videos we did last year the last days our legendary gang stalked our peaceful town were toward the end of my final year at Eastside Elementary I blame my church for the disbanding the Vikings decided to go on an overnight camping trip to Cedar Mountain as we were leaving town, Shelby gave us all a wink and detoured his Schwinn into Wings Mini Mart. Using the same note his dad had written to send him on an errand the week before, Shelby purchased a carton of Marlboros. Okay. This is serious. Yeah. Bad boy. So also, they are 13, so that actually is pretty... Checked out. Intensely bad boy. Yeah. For a 13, I was boy. buying bubblegum cigarettes <clears throat> and getting in trouble for that, so... Avoid the appearance of evil. Yeah, yeah. I can't imagine how actually just going... Full hilt toward mm. evil. You'd think the cashier would have noticed the overnight pack draped over his shoulder and guessed something was amiss. But Wing's employees weren't known for their IQs. Shelby kept his secret in a paper sack all the way to the campsite, delighting in our curiosity. Finally, he brought it out and held it forward with all the pride of a new father. I got queasy inside when I saw what it was. While the other guys were patting Shelby on the back and helping, <laughs> yeah, good job yeah. for getting those things. <laughs> And helping him break all the seals between the carton and the first cigarette, I acted preoccupied building the campfire and said later without looking up. Okay. Oh. He's got a shred of good boy left in him. Yeah. Or unless he's like, he's like, you children, I'm going to go do heroin. We don't know. A year <laughs> of karate training does do a boy good. That's I true. I think. I think so. And I dread to think how many of those marbles he'd be smoking without it. I can't believe <laughs> they went with Vikings and not like moral bros. Yeah. Right there. Right there. But nobody could ever hide a thought from a 12-year-old. The ribbing and teasing began. Toward dark, the harassment grew more intense and more personal, making it the longest camping trip of my life. But Honestly, this checks out. 12 years old was a terrible age. I oh did my not God, enjoy yeah. it. <laughs> yeah. What passed as friendship? <laughs> Just abuse all around in many ways. Abuse Would have liked to experience it in any degree. <laughs> <laughs> then, fortunately, someone brought up girls. Phew. The words were crude, but I sighed with relief. If they had continued their the persecutions, I might have been only minutes away from tasting tobacco. Wow. And after that, you're just pretty much 
Satan spawn. That's like, how do you recover from tasting tobacco? Yeah, then you're Jack Wayne and Stephanie. I once walked into an old bowling alley and tasted it and feel like I might not even qualify for the Celestial Kingdom now. Within two days, I was a lone Viking. No ship or crew. Abandoned. <gasps> Viking alone in the wild? It ought not be. My family walked around There's me no for a eye while. in Viking. No, you can't be two Vikings. You gotta have two eyes in Viking. <laughs> yes, a triangle is the strongest shape. <laughs> I was snapping at anything that moved. Mum and Dad tried to get me on the psychiatrist couch to discuss my problem. Get me on the psychiatrist couch. <laughs> or did they cut you into the bishop? I just find that very hard to believe because at this time it was pretty. The, the miracle of forgiveness was telling everyone, don't do that. Do we even know if these boys are Mormon at all? I guess we've just completely assumed. Yeah, but they may not. Mm. They may not be. I guess, he, yeah, this could Billings, be like, like my parents sent me to the psychiatrist. To a psychiatrist, not even a psychologist. Yeah. It's like they're like, you need to Drugs. be drugged. Which maybe he's experiencing psychosis. And maybe that's the point for this whole book that he no. doesn't remember well, writing. I can clear up everything with the next sentence. Because he says, I couldn't talk to them. I blame them for it. The church and I weren't on speaking terms either. In sacrament meeting that Sunday, they sang, they sang there is sunshine in my soul. Mrs. Gilchrist, with a neck like a turtle was furiously conducting. The sound I heard resembled bleating sheep. When Bishop Winters talked, I could mouth nearly every word before it was spoken. It all came to a... A real problem I had in church. Yeah, and if a 12-year-old is picking up on that... It's he's understimulated. And he can't even go to a matinee movie in his town because his parents thought boredom would be the way to go. Well, look, he's in a gang because there's nothing to do. It all came to a head on my very last day in the sixth grade. I overheard Shelby and Slater discussing summer plans. When they saw me, they made an obvious effort to ignore my existence in the universe, but I caught their last words. They had to do with a lunch pail, a surprise, and a meeting after school under the West Wall fire escape. When the bell rang, I wandered around the building myself, wondering if Shelby's lunchbox might offer me a chance to redeem my reputation. As I stepped into the shadow under the fire escape, Shelby, Slater, and Jacko would get... Okay, says four, sorry were gathered around the lunchbox in a circle that gave the appearance of a religious ceremony. I think you took a wrong turn, Jamie, Shelby said, profaning my name. Do I not take the name of the Jamie in vain. <laughs> <laughs> I came to the right place, I said. I overheard you. It sounded like this might be interesting. He's on patrol, Shelby, Jacko warned. You looking for a party? asked Shelby. As I got closer, I could see the idol of worship. It was a can of cold silver. Shelby took the unopened cause silver bullet out of the lunchbox and stroked it like a kitten. They now have a cause, but a, a silver cause is a cause light. Yeah. Maybe this is the 80s, or who knows? But they have one beer between them now. Yeah, between four of them. And the blue is fully lit up. Mm. That is a cold beverage. <laughs> Slater put his arm around my neck and pressed his sticky forehead onto mine. We're about to form a satanic ritual, he announced. <laughs> Why does every Mormon mm. YA author do this? Because ah. this is, yeah. Mm. Also, it's giving, um, what's it called? Don't Ask Alice, is it? Where oh, yeah, A yeah. girl, like, gets really into drugs and, like, Satanism. Do you think he's just joking? Or <clears throat> and that really also it? was apparently, like, a true story, but not a true story. Sorry, you think he's just joking about the Satanic ritual? Could be, could be. We'd hate to corrupt a nice boy like you. I forcefully gave Slater's arm back to him. <laughs> I, with a karate move. Slater? I wish I knew the name of any of them. You can't name somebody named Slater in the height of Save by the Bell hype. <laughs> I was corrupt when you were sucking Gerbers, Slater. Then you wouldn't mind doing the honors, Shelby held the can toward me. It looked as big as an oil drum suspended there in front of my nose. I snatched it from Slater's hand. If I hesitated now, they'd denounce me with more spit and venom than ever before. I popped the tab. The edge of the can sat cool against my lower lip. The brew fell right past my tongue, straight into my throat, one long steady stream. As the can drained, the gang began a chant that grew louder and louder. He's taking it all, Jacko <laughs> protested. <laughs> all our cool. I love the idea that he's never tried beer and he just completely pounded an entire one. Oof. Like, yeah, right. No. <clears throat> but Shelby it. held him at bay. He's like, That'd be like, he smoked the entire bong single. He's like, nah, nah, nah. <laughs> I don't know, maybe you all are... Tougher than me. I, do, I wouldn't even chuck in a beer now. Like, 
to down a beer is not a pleasant experience. Not even a physical possibility for me, I don't think. The final drizzle leached down my chin. I lowered the hollow can, wiped, and studied the approval of my three best friends. The shadow under the fire escape seemed darker. My body didn't feel drunk, but my conscience felt plastered. <laughs> I love that saying. Oh, my conscience has just been plastered this Drunk week. Drunk as shivs. <laughs> this, <Black> out conscience. <laughs> the smiles left the three faces as I dropped the can and walked away. Wow. Can drop. Okay, he is away. a baddie. Yeah, tough, he is. A real tough customer yeah. on our hands. <laughs> Dad would be waiting to pick up Jennifer and me from school for a dental appointment. Turning onto the playground, I saw my family's new Chrysler LeBaron parked beyond the fence. Wow. We got some status. Inside, impatiently wait, watching for me, were Dad and Jen. It's the most polygamous sounding vehicle. I don't even know what a Chrysler, Chrysler LeBaron, LeBaron is, but... <laughs> it sounds evil, doesn't it? It does. It was... Oh. The, the red LeBaron bounced up and down in my vision. Everything started moving in slow motion. It was like watching two carousels spinning beside one another in opposite directions. I suppose a 12-year-old can be quite small. So a, a full beer could absolutely send oh, yeah. you. Yeah. yeah. Pebbles crushing under my feet were unusually loud. This is literally <clears throat> the spooky Mormon hell dream. I used to have nightmares mm-hmm. as a teenager that I had a drink of beer and then was just like, what am I doing? Yeah. He's living that nightmare. The car seemed a million miles away and then in an instant it zoomed in close. As I climbed into the back seat, words like, what took you and where have you been, came swirling around me. My father's eyes were glowing. (laughs) Red. It's floating two feet in the air. Welcome to the Chrysler (laughs) LeBaron, son. (laughs) I was nauseated. Get in, we're doing satanic rituals. (laughs) I had no control. (laughs) We're not going to a matinee. It just happened all over the back seat of the new LeBaron. Every, so he vomited. Everything is kind of blurry after that. All I know for sure is I never saw a dentist. My dad recognized the problem immediately, having seen similar symptoms among his peers (laughs) back in the Air Force. A kid just getting in the car, seeming kind of out of it, and then throwing up. Throwing up an entire Coors Light. He had a Coors Silver Uh, Bullet. I've seen this symptom before. (laughs) When, When my servicemen were puking Coors Light as well. My first clear memory was my darkened bedroom, my face in its pillow. Next, I remember bright lights and impatient voices. My parents asking where they went so wrong that I should turn from all I knew to be just and holy and corrupt my sacred body with an evil and pernicious nectar. Stuff like this really highlights, and Stephanie by Jack Wayland as well, how, mu- like, how much of a big of a deal alcohol was to Mormons at this time. Mm. It was the cornerstone of their identity. Was that I they mean, did not still drink. For still is. Still. But to be this... Scared of it. I just feel like because I came into the church at 17 as a converse in England where, you know, people drink. Mm-hmm. It was like, yeah, don't do that. But just like this level of obsessive anxiety about it mm-hmm. just is a lot. Like, I don't know. Yeah. You found out your kid have a beer, but you don't have to be like, what did we do so wrong? It's his first beer. Maybe it's not. Sentence was finally passed. I was forbidden to see my friends until the end of the millennium. My mother was convinced their influence had caused my questionable behavior for the last couple of years. I failed to mention that it had been my idea to egg Mrs. Uderbach's Suburban and my idea to abscond with all the pies at the Ward's Christmas social. What's abscond mean? To steal? Abscond with all the pies. Yeah, maybe it's like take and run. There were also restrictions against attending the Boy Scout Carnival in Billings that weekend. The oh, Boy no. Scout Carnival? You're going to miss the big Boy Scout Carnival? It's a social suicide. <laughs> I was planning to contract a virus the morning before departure anyway. God, that sounds like hell, a Boy Scout Carnival. <laughs> Brother Jackson, the Scoutmaster with the polygrip smile. What's a polygrip smile? I don't know, but he, he's got some, some liners in here. Yeah. I, I think a step above Jack. Words such as abscond, yeah. you don't hear from You're Jack. You're not going to get that. Um, but what is a polygrip smile? Can we maybe just Google that one? I think a really <clears throat> just like... Can you be Jamie for this? I'll season? be Jamie. Please call me Jim, unless you <laughs> know two years of karate. Karate. <laughs> All right, we're taking a little time travel into the 80s to learn about polygrip. Is a two-component steering-free acrylic system used for anchoring and doweling applications in uncracked concrete. Using what does that mean? Okay, just like permanent smile. Yeah, yeah. 
Uh, Brother Jackson, the scoutmaster, with the polygrip smile, conducting a bus choir. Think Ron DeSantis, like, head, like, I awkwardly tilted. I never think tilted. Ron DeSantis. <laughs> It's not safe. <laughs> There's this one of him going around where he's like, he's like, oh, like human child, and his like head comes like this, and he's standing like this, and the capture was like, this is how a velociraptor would look at a human, <laughs> just. Like... <laughs> uh, conducting a bus choir in yet another four-part rendition of Row 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 would have been worse torture than lying in bed all day. Fair. If you have a bad attitude about rounds, I've based. been saying that, yeah, <laughs> but I do think. A They're Boy fine. Scout bus choir of Ro 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 Off to the carnival. <laughs> it's, Tough. I thought the whole thing would be rounds and gimmicky little games like These that. These kids deserve to just see a fucking movie at 2.30pm yeah. on a Saturday. I think it would cure a lot of what I'm seeing in this book so far. Oh, yeah. My punishments were relatively painless. I was actually grateful to pay my debt to society. It was the entire summer after my parole when life became unbearable. Since I was an ex-con... What? You should oh. be dramatic. Okay. People got quiet when I entered the room. My older brothers became parole officers. They contested among themselves as to who would be the lucky soul to accompany me to the next stake fireside. The only peace I found in an otherwise dismal summer came from tossing hail bells for my uncle Spence on his ranch in Burlington, a few miles south of Cody. Legend had it that he'd been quite the party animal as a young man. Aunt Louise claimed he was a full-fledged alcoholic an accusation that caused Uncle Spence, when I asked him, to chuckle, Louise wouldn't know an alcoholic from an epileptic. I did enjoy the company of my Uncle Spencer. He had known the ways of the world and shunned them. He left me with the only worthwhile advice I got all summer. If you want to sow some oats, Jim, there ain't a soul on this earth who can stop you. Just remember your roots and gargle a lot of scope before you come to the breakfast table. Wise words, Uncle Spencer. (laughs) The ways of the world. Uh, All ways are the world's ways. The volcano erupted... Oh, rapid shift. The volcano erupted one night in August during a pork chop supper. That weekend, a high school kid had been killed on Sylvan Pass Highway while under the influence. Nobody knew the boy personally, only knew of him. The dinner topics were lost youth and the evils of booze. Oh, this is a metaphorical volcano. I am just getting used to Chris's writing style. I, I the whole thing with... I know that we did this already for three books in a row with Jack. <laughs> but, like, you can talk about the negative effects of alcohol. Alcohol is literally poison. You can mm-hmm. talk about all the problems about it without shame, mm-hmm. without spiritual manipulation. It's literally so easy. And people yeah. uh, empowered by information can make more responsible decisions than when they're operating by shame. Mm-hmm. Amen. The dinner topics were lost youth and the evils of booze. I got really uneasy. Each person ended his sermon by throwing a glance in my direction to be sure I'd heard. I shoveled my mashed potatoes as quickly as humanly possible with plans to make a hasty exit. My mother sighed and grew thoughtful. I pray every day, she said, that a phone call like the one that mother received never comes to this house. I dropped my fork. The line was obviously meant for me. Mum, I'm not an alcoholic, okay? Let me work on it. Honestly, your son trying beer for the first time and throwing up is kind of a good thing to happen because that's a pretty bad... That's not going to make someone want to do beer again at Mm. 13, generally speaking. He didn't have a good time and he's only tried it once. So his entire... He's, if anything, more equipped to avoid alcohol now. Uh, I'm not saying this was right or wrong, but my grandpa gave my dad like a little bit of wine as a kid so that my dad would be like, ooh, ew. No, right? And then he grew up being like, ooh, alcohol, like that's that, that disgusting, why me. would I want that? <laughs> it wasn't like, it was deliberately given to me to turn me off alcohol, mm-hmm. but I just think if you grow up with it being, you know, you know it's an adult drink, your parents will let you try a sip and mm-hmm. then they're like, but you won't like it and then you don't like it and mm-hmm. then your curiosity is quenched. So you don't feel, you don't see it as this like illicit taboo, exciting thing the way that you do. Which then leads you to join Mormonism because you want to see have such a negative view of it. Has this ever happened to you? Have you ever tried one sip of alcohol only to join Mormonism? Not funny, Jim. My dad barked. Sorry. My dad began one of his mini lectures. This is a serious issue and a serious problem in this town because there's nothing to do. <laughs> a serious problem in the town where there's nothing for kids to do. That you took them there to feel. Yep. My temple was building. May I be excused? I interrupted. Dad aimed his final point at me like a shotgun. All we want is to know that we, what we can do, sorry, all we want to know is what we can do as a family to keep it from ever going that far. By getting off my back. I won't tell you the words that filled the blanks. Is your dad oh, always riding you? Getting off my blank back. Oh. He won't tell us the words that filled the blanks. I think he said the F word. 
I think that's the only one that would kind of fit linguistically there. Get off my effing back. Yeah? What do you think? Damn. Get off my damn damn back. Could be damn. Could be damn. Just know they sent my audience into an awesome silence. My dad's palm started to rise. He caught it before the slap was launched. Well, he's better than the dad from Saturday's War. Try to catch them all. (laughs) What is a dad's responsibility but to catch that slap? (laughs) (laughs) Then the most horrifying thing happened. Grandmother Tucker put down her fork and stood up. You had to have lived in my family for a while to fully appreciate this moment. You see, my grandmother is... It's a Wonka situation. She's like... It's a Wonka situation. (laughs) You see... I I was going to sing a song, but we don't have to go there. (laughs) It's early in the season for a song. Yeah. (laughs) My grandmother is, how can I put it, a fanatic of sorts. She tortures herself on behalf of the family. During a crisis, she locks herself in her room without food or water and goes on a marathon fast. I love how it sh- he hasn't even said a fanatic for what, but we, we know. We don't need to ask. Yeah, anti-violence demonstrations <laughs> as typified by Gandhi. She learned from the best. How do you think they got the British Empire out of India doing that exact thing? She knows what's good. Several days sometimes. <laughs> it drives my parents nuts. She refuses to come out until the Lord answers her prayers in vision. And oh. she never emerges from that room without claiming he has. Whoa. Now, that is pretty intense. She's good. Yeah, she's a real mystic. When I was nine, my cousin Ruben in Butte, Montana, was riding his dirt bike and got sideswiped by a pickup. His arm was run over by the car behind. They were afraid they'd have to amputate it, but Grandma came forth from the room with a solemn conviction that the arm would be saved, and it was. Dangerous messaging. Really dangerous At least they recognize he's a fanatic. She's a fanatic. I don't need evidence to know what's true. My grandma goes and (laughs) starves herself in a closet for three days and then comes out and says whatever she wants, and that's what's true. (laughs) It's also no way to live because it's like, I mean, the normal Mormon thing of, you know, God will answer your prayers if it's right is healthier Mm. because to, like, devote your life to trying to make one specific outcome that you're not in control of happen for three days... That's just not product. That's not healthy. It's exactly and why, why they, would God want that? It's exactly why they tell you so. <laughs> for those of you who don't know, uh, Latter Day Saints gets what get is what is called a patriarchal blessing, where they go to some old person in the region and he gives them this blessing, and a lot of them are filled with very specific promises that can't will not be fulfilled in that person's life. So there's this. Uh, culture that's cultivated to get people to not talk about it (laughs) because if you really saw how many things don't happen with when people very religiously very inspiredly speak with truth in their hearts of this is going to happen because the spirit of god gave me this revelation it's like yeah most of the time no all Mm -hmm. your grandma who was told that she was going to live to see the second coming didn't actually get to experience that one sorry might have a problem of confirmation bias with old granny here. Mm-hmm. And it's like, what, what's wrong with the kind of prayer that's just like, if you will it to be this way, let it be so. If not, I'm going to leave this one with you. Get about having a human experience rather than starving myself in my room for three days, not engaging with this world that you've built for me. Yeah. Stupid. I became a, a Buddhist through Mormonism being like, oh, my prayers don't actually affect what the outcomes of what happens. So it's much quicker to just use prayer as a device to accept Mm -hmm. whatever is going on in the situation and observe what's happening and plan out ways that I can act to improve that. And then I was like, oh, I guess I just cut out the middleman and... (laughs) Yeah. Grandma went toward her room upstairs. (laughs) She's up again. She's She's like, no, She's like, my grandson's had a beer, so... Someone tell her about ayahuasca. (laughs) Things are about to get real thirsty around here. I clutched... Oh, I clutched my bangs. He has bangs. That's the first time we're hearing that. (laughs) There's pearl clutchers and there's bang clutchers. <laughs> Closed my eyes and dug my elbows into the tablecloth while mum pleaded with the old lady to not do this thing. Please, old lady, do not do this thing. thing. Foolish old woman. <laughs> He's just going through a bad time, part of growing up. He, it's not worth risking your health. She's like, nope, I'm starving till the boys' drinking problems fix. Remember how he said he thought the grandma helped write the book? Does that mean <gasps> that she died fasting for him? Whoa. Because of his one beer? That would be quite the thing to have to live with. Oh my God. Grandma wasn't listening. God would watch over her, she said. Her bedroom door closed with an echo. RIP, Grandma. Though I kept my face on the table, I knew every event as it was happening. My mother, having returned, was giving my father a, shouldn't we do something, look? My dad was responding with a, you got any suggestions, shrug? Followed by an, I'm losing patience with that boy, sigh. Now look what you've done, Jim, was right at the tip of my mother's tongue. She never said it, though. In fact, nobody said anything. 
Forks were scraping plates again. His family scripts, when someone makes a mistake, are so worn in that even when they're not playing out, he can sense them in the air. Jim, eat your dinner, Dad said. I felt robbed. My parents were playing business as usual, determined to let my conscience burn. Hmm, he felt robbed. So he wanted the attention of getting in trouble. He, maybe that's what he's been wanting this whole time, is just a little attention. That's what and we kind of gleaned from poorly. Stephanie. Her dad didn't hug her. Yeah. May I be excused? My dad's voice said yes with perfect pronunciation, like a jury saying guilty. <laughs> yes. How do you mispronounce yes? yes. <laughs> it's sharp. <laughs> I wouldn't look anyone in the face as I went to my room in self-imposed exile for the evening. I couldn't sleep. I tried desperately, but I couldn't clear my head of all the angry voices and haunting images. About 2 a.m., I gave up the fight and climbed out of bed. <laughs> Literally spooky Mormon hell dream. Yeah. A light still crept out from under the door of my grandmother's bedroom. She was still at it. How could anybody pray that long? Once I had a goal to pray for 15 minutes. I felt stupid with nothing to say after five. She was going on seven hours now. My feet st Turns out you can say a lot to somebody who doesn't talk back. Yeah. <laughs> You're not left with nothing but your own. <laughs> my feet stepped delicately up the stairway. I was determined to knock, but my fist hung suspended at her door. It was hopeless. I turned around and started back. Grandma's door whipped open and light burst into the hallway. Her arched silhouette stood in the doorway. Jamie, honey, come in, she called. So she's done three years of karate at least. Oh, yeah. <clears throat> she seemed to know and I'd been there all along. Taller. She seems like the full package. Definitely. <laughs> Brown belt, uh, six Author four. Author of obscure books. <laughs> yep. The lady had x-ray vision, I swear. Sorry, Grandma, I didn't mean to wake you. I was wide awake. Come in. I have something wonderful to tell you. Uh-oh, I thought. Her clammy hand grabbed mine and led me into her room. The place smelled old, like always, but it was particularly nauseating this early in the morning. She is a crone archetype, if there ever was one. Mm. She's about to... She's the old lady mystic who... Mm -hmm. Perceive something on deeper... Yeah, maybe she's going to be the guide on this hero's journey. I think she is. She sat me beside her on the bed. The old woman seemed more flexible. Qu referring to your grandma as the old woman? <laughs> like, what kind of relationship do you guys have? Like, Well, we know he has a bad attitude about practically everything. That's your grandmother, <laughs> sir! And, like, her, the, her smell is nauseating. He described another woman at church as having a turtleneck. I just feel like there's a lot of ageism in this book so far. <laughs> she seemed more flexible, more alive than I'd seen her in years. She put her arm around me and we locked eyes. She'd glared at me this way once or twice before, but it had only been to tell me that my eyes were tucker blue. I want to know, little Jamie, she began, as though I were a six-year-old, that the Lord loves you very much. The way my body stiffened, my discomfort must have been obvious, but Grandma only tightened her hold. See, that's a yellow flag. She's saying the Lord loves you and his body's immediately stiffening. Yeah. Dysregulation immediately. How much has that been used against him in his life? And why do we always have to use the this our imaginary friend as a proxy for conversations? Yeah. Why can't it why? just be like, I, your grandmother, I love you very love much. You very much. Yeah. <laughs> she continued, he knows these are the most difficult years of your life. You're at the age when you know everything. I don't know everything. You even know that, said grandma. The point being that you've begun to think for yourself and question everything you've ever been told. It's good to do that. If we were to remain sheep all our lives, nobody would ever learn. You understand? Yeah, I lied. The Lord is going to do something very special for you. She stopped talking. Like what? I said, ending her dramatic pause. I don't know. He simply assured me he would do it. And he will. You can bet on it. That's great, Grandma. She laughed inside. I could tell because her shoulders started to vibrate and air came through her nose in little bursts. Grandma knew every thought I was thinking. Now it's late and we must both go to bed. Sh I moved to go. Good night, Grap. She tightened her grip again. Those old eyes were glistening. They came out at me like 3D. Aren't eyes already 3D? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Even extra 3D. 3D plus. <laughs> You're a special boy, Jamie, and you'll know it very soon. She was scaring the heck out of me. My whole body was tingling. I'll... My voice cracked and I cleared my throat. I'll see you in the morning, Grandma. I was already out the door when I heard her voice whisper, Good night, Jamie. Wow. I think she has hidden mystical powers. Mm -hmm. She's a clairvoyant and possibly the most powerful mystic <laughs> of all, a mime. Mm -hmm. <laughs> she does it all through eye, uh -huh. eye contact. All right, so, I'm, so this is next chapter is when I'm assuming we'll be plunged into 
We better. I can't take any yeah. more of this Cody Wyoming business. This, yes, <laughs> what a shit. I'm dying to see. I'm about to right turn now. to alcoholism yeah. and uh, gang alley alley ship. <laughs> Initial impressions. Um, it's like Jack Wayland and not like Jack Wayland at the same time. If mm. you know what I mean. You can tell the prominent influence is shared. Yes, one hundred percent. Yeah, I don't really. I mean, so far it's almost like. I guess it's just a more fantastical version of Jack Wayland because he's going to be plunged into Mormon Narnia. I th- I think I think he's a better writer than Jack Wayland. I, I said it and I'm saying it again. I think <sighs> a this, bit, yeah, a bit, yeah. There's definitely more. He actually like did suspense by what the characters said, whereas Jack Wayland would just be like. Grandma came in and told me something huge was going to happen. Yeah, but this was and then like, give us two, yeah, yeah, two paragraphs yeah. of. Then I looked outside at Cody, Wyoming, and boy, was it gray, and was it real gray, but at least I'm a Mormon guy. Yeah. <laughs> so we, we're just, we're, pl- we're reading this whole book, we're, huh? Yeah, we're diving we're, in. We're doing it. We're pulling ourselves up by our tennis shoes and doing it. Yeah, I have a feeling things are going to get deep and dark. We'll be reading all the rest of this uh, book on Patreon week by week, as we've done with our Jack Whalen books. Uh, just because we didn't want to clog the main channel with just tennis shoes for what feels like a year, to be honest. We'll see. This will be a slog, I think. This will be a slog, <laughs> but we're all in it together. Yeah, it's fun doing series on Patreon. I feel like they get funnier and more interesting as you go because there's shared lore, shared jokes, and it just becomes kind of a virus that takes over your brain, but in a way that is like at least that's kind of crowding out some of your other anxious thoughts. Yeah, it suspends your ego and it the, really del- the relief and delight is mm-hmm. just like a temporary lobotomy. It's delightful. <laughs> <laughs> yep, so support us on Patreon and you too can get a temporary tennis shoe among the Nephites lobotomy. Okay, <laughs> love you. Was that it? Are we leaving so soon? Yeah. Yeah, I guess we were just gone for so long and then we just we read this. <laughs> <laughs> and that's just Now it. I just don't know what my life's about, you know. <laughs> No aftercare, no pre-qualifications, nothing. It's just that, that, that. Ooh. See ya. Yeah. Have I, a nice new year. I haven't even properly said hi to Banksy yet. Aww. And I, I can tell he knows. <laughs> also, we are still fundraising to keep the channel going in 2024. We are able to keep doing this because of donations. So if you don't want to join us on Patreon, we have PayPal and Venmo, and that's linked in the description. Yeah, thanks for watching. Bye, that's the end. Should do a thumbnail. Yes. All right, everybody say hi, Merdinger. You're gonna 